Hi, everybody. I hope you are enjoying Virtual Crime Con. I'm Josh Mankiewicz. Delighted to be with you. And sorry that we're not all meeting in person the way we normally do. Maybe next year. Uh, we at Dayline have some news, which is that we have a new podcast that's ready or almost ready. Uh, you're probably familiar with our podcast from the past. We had a great one uh, done by producer Dan Slepian called 13 Alibis. Uh, Keith did one called The Thing About Pam. Uh, I did one earlier this year um, called Motive for Murder. And now we have a new one coming shortly. Keith's going to do it. And it's about a story that I'm pretty sure all of you know, which is the story of of the Vallows and their kids and everything that happened uh, when the story broke. And then sort of you watched it unspool along the way, the way that we did. But this is not my story. I didn't cover it. Keith covered it. Mm -hmm. Keith is here with us today. Hello. Hello, Josh. Tell me about this podcast. Why This, this is something that we did a number of Dateline hours on three, four, five. Well, I think we're up to uh, three so far. <laughs> we have we have more to go, I'm sure. It's a it's a continuing story. It keeps rolling out new remarkable things keep happening, and and you just every time you think, okay, we've 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 got that case now until something significant happens. Well, something significant will happen, or some new uh, element will emerge even as we have been working on this podcast new elements have been popping up that we want to now include um, so it's a it's a work in progress it's an amazing story you know one of the things I, this story has sort of broken a lot of our rules as we went down the road with uh -huh. it i mean there are a lot of things that that are true about this story that are not true about a lot of other dateline stories for example most dateline stories by the time we start covering them the story's already over. The case has been fully adjudicated. The person's been, you know, acquitted or convicted or, or sentenced. And we, have, and we have everybody involved. Uh, in this case, we were covering it sort of as it unfurled. Yeah. Um, we also frequently don't do stories in which kids are the victims. And in this case, we did. So tell me about covering this story in, in this new way, which was while it was happening, not after it happened. Well, um, these are the ones I actually enjoy more than, more than most, frankly, is because it's a process of discovery for everybody, including us. And um, you're, you feel as if you're racing along with events, uh, uh, trying to keep up with them, trying to see where they'll lead you next. Um, so it's more of from a reporter's point of view, or, a, or you know, reporter, producer, et cetera, point of view, is that you're following people as they are going through these events. And um, every once in a while, you stop and report progress. Um, it is somewhat unusual for us, but, but it's, it's a fascinating way to go about it. Usually when we're doing a story, we know how it comes out. When you first went to Kauai, which was very soon after, uh, after those kids were declared missing, you didn't know how this was going to come out. Nope, that's right. And uh, but we knew it was it, we knew it was significant, and we we thought we knew some things that were going on in the, in, in behind the scenes, but uh, you couldn't report it because you couldn't absolutely be sure. And uh, you knew the investigation was continuing, but um, there was enough there for us to. I mean, we were just so interested, and we found that you know, a lot of people were and still are. Uh, the thing has not stopped moving. This is, this is still a moving ball and we're still following it. There are quite a few legal proceedings that haven't happened yet, right? There are, yes. And, and they are complicated by COVID, of course. So everything is being pushed back and delayed and um, uh, prosecutors are thinking about other ways of going about, about the process. Uh, you know, one more thing that struck me as being a, a a completely different scenario than the way we normally cover stories at Dateline. Usually, not all the time, but usually we don't have unfettered access to the person who is accused. I mean, if hmm. they're locked up, sometimes they talk, sometimes they don't, but maybe they're going to talk one time at most from behind bars with the advice of their attorney. Um, generally, you don't have the opportunity to interview them again and again and again before they are ever in custody, uh -huh. not knowing whether they ever will be in custody. But that's what happened on this, isn't it? Well, to some degree. Um, 
you know, I think that they were trying to avoid us as much as they could, but, you know, the, you, you have an opportunity in public to ask questions, and they can either answer them or not answer them. Um, but we, we kind of did know um, what was likely to transpire, and we could sit around and wait, wait for it to happen. Now, that's a fascinating place to be, as you know a police department or a series of police departments working in concert in different states uh, with different agencies, including the FBI, including local police, including sheriffs, are all kind of cooperating, trying to figure out what the next step for them will be. And we can watch it unfold in real time. And when we're listening to this podcast, you get sort of a sense of how this unfolds. I mean, you're sort of you're sort of hearing it unfold as we pursue the story, as you and your team go after it. That is correct, yes. Uh, I think that's really what makes these things interesting. Uh, it, it's been so fascinating for us, and so we recreate that journey to some degree uh, when you listen to the podcast. Um, now, uh, you guys went to Hawaii again and again and again <laughs> covering this story. Uh, when I was doing the research, I read that you and your team made a total of 13 trips to Hawaii, which let me just say internally at Dateline, <laughs> I need to take my hat off to you and your producers. Well, well um, unfortunately, that wasn't me a lot of the times because it, we work, as you know, Josh, we work with it. We work with people who are really at the top of the, at the top of the game and are the best in the business. And, and they do so much of the groundwork. Um, and you and I get to kind of be surfers along on the wave. Uh, we do. That is absolutely true. I, uh, I I commend you and the rest of them for going to Hawaii 13 times. Generally, when I'm on American <laughs> Eagle heading from Midland, Texas, the pilot's like, uh -huh. hey, nice to see you again. Yeah, that's that's what we uh, we planned that all the way along, Josh. Yeah. you Midland is where it's a great place. We, I like Midland. Don't you? There are some iconic moments in this story. I mean, uh -huh. times in which you... You guys did everything you could to try to be in the same place as Chad and Lori Val. And sometimes mm -hmm. you were and sometimes you weren't. But, uh, I mean, there was a there was a real cat and mouse game going there on, was, wasn't there? Uh, there absolutely was. And and, uh, and trying to suss out where they were and, and how to get in that place and how to find them. Um, it was really the same. It was the same process that the uh, authorities were following to some degree. And then and sometimes you know, you're we, sort of doing the same thing the police are doing. I yep. mean, you're 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 trying to find them, and the police are trying to find them. And you're trying not to get into the way of the get in the in the in the way of the police as as they're doing their work. So there is a responsibility, I think, not to uh, put a big fat imprint on on events as they transpire, but merely to be able to watch them as they occur. A lot of people, I think, know the ending. I'm not going to talk about it, but this is a story I think that's pretty well known to our audience and certainly, I, I think, probably known to the CrimeCon audience, too. But the procedure by which this all sort of unfolded, that's the thing I think that you're going to get a sense of uh, in this podcast that maybe people aren't aware of. You are, uh, but also, um, we, as I say, this is still moving. Things are still happening. And what may seem like an ending isn't necessarily. Um, more occurrences are being uncovered. More suspicions are being fleshed out. Uh, more things may have happened than we know about even today, even now. Um, and it, just in the last couple of weeks, Josh, we've learned a lot more than we knew before, and we've been able to get more material than we even thought existed. And gosh, it's pretty interesting. And this is all going to be part of the podcast, which hasn't Absolutely. been part of which hasn't been part of previous dateline hours. That is correct, yeah. One of the things I learned when doing that podcast is, you know, a dateline hour is about thirty seven or thirty eight minutes uh -huh. of actual us telling you the story. <laughs> it's distressing, isn't it? You know, once you take out all the other things in the broadcast uh -huh. and uh, and even at 37 or 38 minutes, as you know, there's a great deal we end up having to leave out. It goes by in a hurry. In a podcast, you really can put in whatever you think is interesting and germane and new. And it doesn't really matter whether the episode is 22 minutes long or 28 minutes long or 37 minutes long. And for me, anyway, that was a huge luxury. 
it it is it is freeing and and also frankly it's uh it it's it's kind of like going back to radio you can you can uh, make the pictures with the words and you can uh, uh you're a lot freer to kind of go off and talk about this and talk about that and the other thing without worrying about how you're going to make it visually interesting uh, so removing that element of the storytelling allows you to tell more than you otherwise would who is it that you have not yet spoken to that you still want to talk with on this story? Well, the principals. I want to sit down with those two people at the center of the story to find out what in heaven's name they were thinking. And, of course, they probably still think it was in heaven's name, but um, that to me is fascinating. What, what were these personalities? What are they all about? How did they come by these ideas? Whatever gave them the notion that they could think these things? Uh, as much as I know about this story, which I know from having watched your Dateline Hours and read a bunch of stuff about it, there's this huge backstory that happened sort of before those kids went missing that, like, is almost impossible to keep straight. It's complicated. But, you know, if you if you listen to it spin out, it makes perfect sense. Um, and you're going to go through all of that. I mean, by the time absolutely. we're finished with the podcast... Sure. I'll I'll know the story, maybe not as well as you did, but but better than I do now. <laughs> That's the idea, Josh. That's why we tell them. <laughs> so, what are we going to see? What, what are we going to hear in this podcast that we haven't? That we I'll haven't tell you what you're going to see. You're going to see not a darn thing. You're going to hear it. Well, because no. I'm going to have my eyes closed most of the time, imagining <laughs> you telling yeah. me the story in Hawaii. I will yeah. say I will say this to the podcast audience. I presume that. Uh, I will say this to the CrimeCon audience, which is also our podcast audience. Uh -huh. I presume that many of you have heard uh, Dateline podcasts before, either the showcasts we do or the original ones that Keith and I and, uh, and earlier our producer Dan did. Um, I will say that your voice, which is so sensational and, and beloved on Dateline, it's I know you really hate it when I do this. I know you hate this, but the truth is, as great as your voice is on Dateline, it's like 10 times better on a podcast. It's, it's amazing. Uh -huh. And so I'm looking forward to this podcast, really just to hear you telling me that story. No, it's because you've been having trouble sleeping and this puts you to sleep. We'll see. Mm -hmm. What else? What else? What else? I know you're going to, we're going to hear, we're going to hear the interviews that you have already done, but we're going to hear well, them in some more depth, I think. Exactly. And, and as you quite correctly pointed out, that one of the frustrations is when you have a limited amount of time, you have to select the best bits of uh, interviews you've done. And those best bits are always leaving out some things you'd really like to include. This gives us the opportunity to let people talk for longer than we otherwise would. You still have to edit. You still have to cut things shorter than, frankly, I would like to. But, you know... Um, you have to. Um, yeah. Peter Ustinov once said, everything that's ever been written is just a little bit too long. And unfortunately, we run into that obstacle all the time. I know. Every time I go back over a script, I think like, oh, yeah, I can make that a lot shorter. I take something out. Yeah. yeah. By the way, can we, uh, can we just talk a little bit here at the end about um, sort of what life has been like to work through, through COVID and through the lockdown? Uh, we've done a lot of interviews. Uh, for yep. Dateline, just the way we're doing this one, which right. is you and I are not in the same room. And you and I are talking via Zoom. And I've found doing a lot of interviews this way, I thought it was going to be difficult and awkward. But the fact is, um, talking with you is no more difficult and awkward than it normally is. <laughs> in some ways, easier. <laughs> but um, I have to agree with you, actually. we I was worried about it. Um, didn't know how we'd manage it because as you know, our, our job is to travel around the country talking to people in places we'd otherwise probably not go. Um, get to know those people, get to know those towns. And I love that just as you love that. Yeah. So I was quite worried what, whether this would work or not. And we've all seen the, the tele, on television uh, people appearing in their living room on Zoom cameras. And you don't want to look like that necessarily either. Uh, so... Happily, some some yeah, some good minds at Dateline put their put their heads together and came up with uh, you know the best possible uh, television crews and and the best ideas about how to make this work and it's just kind of like sitting in the same room with you because we're not we're communicating through Zoom but we're actually being photographed through the same kind of cameras that we've used on Dateline for years right. sure 
and that makes a big difference as, as opposed Huge to difference. looking down at the at the zoom monitor mm -hmm. um i too miss not being able to meet the people in the story in person and you know do the uh uh spend time with them and 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 do the do the due diligence of getting to know somebody before you sit down and do an interview and see what that town's like and what sort yeah. of feel you get and i do hope that we're going to get back to that when uh when all this is over we will it, 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 but but we're a ways away from it still on the first we do hope this will all end someday someday soon in the meantime we'll be home with your podcast keith uh keith thank you for joining us thank you josh everybody else enjoy crime con hope to see you in person one of these days dateline friday nights nine o'clock eastern and pacific don't watch alone but you need